Members of the Hobart and William Smith Colleges community, it's my honor to officially proclaim the 2017-18 academic year open. Colleagues and returning students, welcome back. And a special welcome to the classes of 2021. To open today's ceremony, please welcome Chaplain Morris Charles. Please be seated. Behold, I make all things new. I hear these words echo in the distance. They fire the imaginations of poets, priests, and prophets. They are inscribed on the altar of St. John's Chapel, and they welcome all of us to a new academic year. Classes of 2021, welcome. No longer say to yourselves, I have come to a new school. You are the school. And I encourage you from the very beginning to claim your space, name your truths, and make your marks on Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Those of us who welcome you here today do so with pride and deep joy. We feel joy because we have the privilege of watching this community renew itself every year. We invite you to join us in fashioning the kind of model community the world longs for. Now that you are the school, open your hearts to one another. Commend outdated prejudices to the grave where they belong. Challenge ideas, but cherish the speakers. Treat one another with the dignity you so richly deserve. By doing these things, make it possible for us to work together to build the kind of learning community where everyone has a chance to flourish, a community made brand new. I am honored now to welcome my friend to the podium from the Hobart class of 1968, Director of Hobart Athletics, Mike Hanna. Thank you, Chaplain Charles and Professor Brophy. It's an honor to be here today to introduce my classmate, the Chair of the Board of Trustees, Thomas S. Pizzuto. Perhaps the greatest measure of a college or university can be found in the outcomes of its graduates. And at HWS, we have some extraordinary alums. Within our ranks are scientists and teachers, heads of corporations and physicians, writers and filmmakers, politicians and artists, architects and bankers, professional athletes, and yes, even athletic directors, intellectually curious, purpose-driven, and service-minded Hobart and William Smith graduates are united in their dedication to lead a life of consequence. Leading the way is Tom Bizzuto. Tom has served our alma mater as a member of the Board of Trustees since 1999 and as chair for the past two years. I know no one more devoted to our colleges than Tom Bizzuto is. During a 40-year career in real estate, Tom co-founded the Bizzuto Group, one of the most prominent real estate services companies in the country. The Bizzuto Group is regularly recognized as one of the best places to work in the Baltimore and Washington, D.C. areas, and Tom's leadership has earned him numerous well-deserved awards. I know many of our students here today have served internships with his company, and over the years, the Bizzuto Group has wisely hired many of our graduates. To the great benefit of our colleges, Tom has taken his significant expertise and applied it to Hobart and William Smith. 
Over the past two decades, every facility project on our campus is firmly rooted in his stewardship and vision. Tom was the lead donor in the renovation of the college's boathouse, named in honor of his late father, Charles. Bazuto Boathouse gives our sailing team a remarkable home base. Together with his wife, Barbara, they have established scholarships here and generously supported the Guerin Center for the Performing Arts. 53 years ago, Tom and I arrived on this campus as freshman roommates, first floor of Cheryl Hall. We became football teammates. We worked in Saga together. Later, we became fraternity brothers. Upon graduating, Tom and I enlisted in the United States Army, each of us serving a tour of duty in South Vietnam. Tom was an English major, active in Little Theater, and I can tell you he was a highly, highly regarded student leader, very much appreciated for his work on behalf of the student body. As a senior, Tom was elected as a, to, uh, as a Druid, and during his time here, his freshman year, he was our uh, class vice president and later became our class president. So today marks the start of my 47th year in higher education and college athletics. Along the way, I've had a lot of special, exciting moments. But today's opportunity to introduce Tom certainly ranks among the most special. Ladies and gentlemen, from the great Hobart class of 1968, please join me in greeting Thomas S. Bizzuto. Tom? I was wondering if Mike was going to admit that we were roommates. He, he was actually the very first person I met at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And to this day, I stand in awe of his contribution to this community. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. As the chair of the Board of Trustees, it is an honor to be here to celebrate the opening of the academic year. This is also my opportunity to formally introduce the campus community to our new president. In a sea of incredibly qualified presidential candidates, Greg Vincent's passion for the liberal arts his expertise in higher education, and his entrepreneurial leadership style stood out. He has something special, a deep knowledge of our history, and a passion to put the colleges to new levels of achievement. We are thrilled to have him. A national expert on civil rights, social justice, and campus culture, President Vincent previously served at the University of Texas at Austin as Vice President for Diversity and Community Engagement, W.K. Kellogg Professor of Community College Leadership and Professor of Law. He earned his law degree from Ohio State and his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. During Greg's career, he's been a civil rights attorney, a successful college administrator, a noted scholar and author, and a gifted faculty member. And it all started right here at Hobart College, where President Vincent majored in history and economics, was an RA, and was a member of the Hobart basketball and cross country teams. I often say that the best leaders know there is only one response to a compliment about their achievements, and that is that they've got a great team. And President Vincent has that in the talented faculty and staff 
who have dedicated their careers and their lives to ensuring that the colleges and our students thrive. To each of these extraordinary people, I'd like to say thank you. To our students, welcome to a new academic year. Please know that there is a substantial cohort of extraordinary alumni and alumni ready and willing to assist you at any time. I urge you to take advantage of us. We are here for you. Ladies and gentlemen, one of our distinguished alums, our new president from the Hobart class of 1983, Gregory J. Vincent. Thank you, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. I want to welcome our student leaders, Ali Cheney and Tanir Benerson, student trustees, Brianna Moore and Tyler Fuller, our interim provost, Dwayne Lucas, our senior dean of faculty, Nan Crystal Ahrens, deans Eugen Bearer and Lisa Kainzig, Professor Scott Brophy, athletic directors Mike Hanna and Deb Stewart, and our very special guest from the great William Smith class of 1983, Laura Seidel. <laughs> Members of the faculty, staff, and students of Hobart and William Smith and our Geneva neighbors, Welcome to Convocation. On this late summer day, we are called together as a community to celebrate the opening of what promises to be a remarkable academic year, one marked by excellence in the classroom, on the stage, and on the playing fields, and one in which we hold ourselves and one another to the highest standards, both as intellectuals and human beings. We welcome back to campus a talented group of sophomores, juniors, and seniors, as well as the newly arrived members of the classes of 2021. With enhanced academic preparation and quality measured by class rank, standardized tests, and greater diversity, the classes of 2021 are among the most engaging and vibrant we have ever enrolled. Thanks to the work of our orientation coordinators, Michaela Carney and Tanir Benerson, the classes of 2021 have successfully navigated orientation and spent their first day in Geneva in service to the community. And today, they attended their first college courses. Classes of 2021, please stand and be acknowledged. Like the students they will mentor and teach, our new faculty members were selected from a competitive pool of candidates. The newest members of the faculty and staff join our extraordinary colleagues who work each day to distinguish this institution as a place of academic expectation and impressive outcomes. With gratitude to this community that is our home, with appreciation for the responsibilities entrusted to me and anticipation of a promising year ahead, I open the convocation exercises. Now, you have noticed on this stage there are a number of alumni and alumnae. That is by design. Especially in my first year as president, I want to make sure that we are highlighting our graduates and most importantly, calling on their expertise and perspectives as we make sense of an increasingly complex world. 
Joining us to deliver the convocation address it is an alumna who is uniquely poised to do just that. Like Scott Brophy, Tom Pizzuto, and Mike Hanna, she is truly leading a life of consequence from the great class of 1983. Laura Seidel is the digital culture correspondent for National Public Radio, where she regularly appears on NPR's All Things Considered, Morning Edition, and Weekend Edition. Laura was also my classmate, and she was known across campus as a rock star when she was here. She double majored in history and was very, very involved in theater. She was known for her energy and quick wit. She was curious and got involved in all sorts of clubs and organizations. And she took full advantage of her classes. When she graduated, she did so with honors, Magna Cum Laude, and as a member of Phi Beta Kappa. She is someone I admired greatly. It is no surprise to me that her career has soared. Today, Laura Seidel is one of our nation's leading voices on the ways in which technology is transforming our culture and how we live. It is one of the reasons why the William Smith Alumni Association decided to award her the prestigious Alumna Achievement Award. I now like to ask two alumna to please come to the podium to present Laura Seidel with the Alumni Achievement Award. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Kathy Killius Regan from the William Click Class of 1982, who's the Assistant Vice President for our alum, Alumni Relations, and, and Kara Heineck Klinggard from the William Smith Class of 2008, Chair of the Alumni Associ Association Honors Committee, who is a school psychologist. Thank you, President Vincent. The Alumna Achievement Award is the William Smith Alumni Association's highest honor. It's given to an alumna who, by reason of outstanding accomplishments in her particular business, profession, or community service, has brought great honor and distinction to her alma mater. Laura Seidel has dedicated her life to groundbreaking journalism, lending her voice to the pursuit of truth and knowledge throughout an award-winning career at the most well-respected and influential radio outlets in the nation. After earning her Juris Doctorate from Yeshiva University's Cardoza School of Law, Laura began her career in radio at WNYC, where her reports on race relations, city politics, and activism earned her accolades from numerous organizations such as the Society of Professional Journalists and American R Women in Radio and Television. Later, as a technology reporter, Seidel was on the front lines of the rise on, of Silicon Valley. After finishing a one-year fellowship with the National Arts Journalism Program at Columbia University, Laura served as a teaching fellow at the Graduate School of Journalism at University of California, Berkeley. She joined National Public Radio in 2003, where she appears on All Things Considered, Morning Edition, Weekend Edition, and NPR.org. Over her career, she has covered politics, arts, media, religion, and entrepreneurship. She has traveled through India and China to look at the impact of technology on developing nations. She teamed with Alex Bloomberg of NPR's Planet Money team and reported on the impact of patent tolls, trolls on business and innovations particular to the tech world. The results were a series of pieces that appeared on This American Life and All Things Considered, that earned the Gerald Loeb Award and accolades from investigative reporters and editors. Last year, her investigation of the origins of a fake news story led her to the doorstep of a fake news godfather who was running a small publishing empire out of his home in Southern California. Her report won a National Headliner Award and was nominated for a Mirror Award by Syracuse University. 
Today, we recognize Laura Seidel with the Alumna Achievement Award for her commitment to knowledge and truth, for her important contributions to journalism, for her keen insight into, into the questions that define the modern world, and for the important difference she has made in the history of her alma mater, we honor Laura Seidel today. Oh, wow, it's so strange hearing about all of that um, when you're just sitting there listening to other people talk about you. But thank you so much for having me here. Thanks to President Greg Vincent uh, for inviting me and the William Smith Alumni Association. It is actually incredibly nice to be back on this campus, and it's an honor to be chosen to speak before you. Uh, and I want to say right now, it is warm and beautiful. You should take advantage of the lake and the warmth while you still have it, because it is going to get cold. And it's going to get gray. The upside is it makes it easier to study. Now, the last time I was on this campus is also the last time I used a typewriter. You guys know what that is? Whiteout, anyone? Microfiche? You Google it all. Um, when I was here, there were no cell phones either. So if mom or dad called, you could say, sorry, I was out of the room. I was studying. The world has changed a great deal, and the world you are about to enter as adults is going through a growth spurt, and there are a lot of awkward phases. And I want to say to you that you are very lucky, really, to be here at this moment. You have a moment to take a breath and examine where you fit in to the arc of human history and what contributions you can make that fits who you are. You've got a moment here to step back outside of the daily worries that are going to consume most of your life when you leave here and to actually think bigger. And you have a community of people here who you'll be able to talk to about ideas. And that's really special. And I want to share with you uh, some thoughts on what was most important to me about the time I spent here. And perhaps, I hope, you can find something in what I talk about that will inspire you. Now, I happen to be a history major. And that may not be your path. But I know that the colleges have always taken pride in giving people a rounded education. This is a liberal arts college. Take advantage of that. Even if you're pre-med, pre-law, take some history, literature, anthropology, you won't regret it. And if you're on the humanities path, take some science, the hardcore kind, some economics. Learn about the central and sometimes contradictory ideas that are the foundation of our society and civilization. Take the time here to look at yourself in the long arc of human history. And despite the fact that these are challenging times in which we currently live, and I won't kid you, they are, still, if you look back, you'll begin to realize actually how lucky you are. You're living in a time when there's actually less war, less famine, longer life expectancies. You are lucky. A thousand years ago, you'd be worrying about the next plague and whether some tribe was going to come and take your crop. And as many injustices are there, as there are left in the world, there is also now more tolerance than ever before. When I was growing up, pretty much all newscasters and anchors were men. While men still have probably still some of the highest profile jobs, there has been change, and I have been very fortunate to work at a network where women have been able to take leading roles. When I attended the colleges, I never imagined that among the most popular hosts on TV would be a lesbian who's legally married to another woman and a single African-American, uh, and, and a, an African-American woman who grew up the poor daughter of a single mother. I mean, of course, Ellen DeGeneres and Oprah Winfrey. And a lot of what you learn here may not seem terribly applicable to the rest of your life. I confirm that reading Nabokov will not necessarily result in more than good conversation. And yet, it could turn out to be very important. 
And I want to explain how my honors thesis on Dostoevsky underlies a project I'm working on at NPR. Really. My major was Russian cultural history, and I looked at how historical events were reflected in the art and literature of Russia. Yatoja uchila yazik, and that's about all I remember. The focus of my honors thesis was an image that appeared in three novels by Dostoevsky, and I know this sounds obscure, bear with me. Um, In these no novels, which are often filled with sort of philosophical meanderings of his strange, complex, and interesting characters, there's this image of the Crystal Palace. And it was a building that was made of iron and glass for the World's Fair in 1851 in London. And the world was, at this time, in the middle of an industrial revolution. And many of the great thinkers of the time believed that science and reason would end all war and all the world's ills. Dostoevsky did not believe this. One of the novels that this image appeared in is Crime and Punishment, which is truly a great novel, and if you have a chance to read it, please do. Um, it's a wonderful crime story. The main character, Raskolnikov, kills an old woman, a pawnbreaker, who he believes is a pox on the world, and he thinks that as a rational man, that he can make his own morals and choose his own path and not be bothered by his conscience. The image of the Crystal Palace appears as the symbol of the kind of future-looking great man that Raskolnikov believes himself to be, one who can make decisions in a reasonable way for the good of the world. In the end, he is so bothered by his own conscience that he turns himself in. He discovers that, in fact, he has not just a head but a heart. So what does this have to do with me today? Who covers the impact of technology on culture and society for NPR? What Dostoevsky taught me was that we humans are not always rational. We don't always do what's in our best interest. The inventions of the industrial age and advances in science have made the world better and safer. We have clean running water, antibiotics, more dependable food, but we also have terrorism. People still murder each other, do drugs and so forth. I would argue that today, the Crystal Palace is Silicon Valley. As part of my job, I've met some of the most brilliant people, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google. Most recently, I had an interview with a guy named Vint Cerf. He invented the internet, really. At least he was part of a very small team that invented it, and I took the opportunity to ask Mr. Cerf if he knew that his innovation would change the world, he said yes, he did. He imagined it was going to allow for all kinds of communications and sharing of thoughts and ideas. And then I said to him, did you ever imagine harassment, cybercrime, or that terrorists would be using the internet as a recruiting tool? And he said, and I quote, yeah, well, to be honest, no. And this interview will appear in an upcoming story on NPR that's part of a series that looks sometimes into the darker side of what happens when great new, new technologies meet human nature. And I really feel deeply that underlying this series I'm working on is the time I spent reading Dostoevsky. And every time I hear a tech visionary tell me how wonderful their new invention is going to be, how great it's going to make the world, I think about what I learned reading Dostoevsky. Yes, Facebook is bringing us closer together, but we might not always use that ability for the good. We might share fake news just for the fun of it, just because we can. And I feel that I'm a better journalist for having read Dostoevsky. My early years as a journalist were at WNYC in New York, and I was reporting on the culture and politics of New York City's racial and ethnic communities, and that included the Russian community. Uh, so my background was useful, but I will also say the fact that I had learned a great deal about the culture, about a culture that was not my own, helped me approach other communities, Dominicans, Haitians, Orthodox Jews, and so forth. And by studying and learning about one culture different from my own, I was able to understand how complex we are. That the way people behave and think and see themselves is interwoven with where they grew up, with their family histories, their first language. 
And as a public radio journalist, I enjoyed nothing better than to listen and try to understand where people were coming from. I'm going to give you one more reporting story here. In 1987, there was an African-American teenager named Tawana Brawley. And she was found one, one night in a horrible state covered with feces and racial slurs. She accused four white law enforcement officials of raping her. But a grand jury then determined that her story was fake. And that most likely what happened is she made up a story to avoid being punished by her stepfather. A few years later, one of the officials she accused sued the four men who had represented her. He sued them for defamation. He said they knew that she was falsely accusing him of a crime and yet continued to perpetuate this. You may have heard of one of the men who was on trial for defamation. His name was Al Sharpton. And I got to sit through that defamation trial and it was fascinating. Not because of what was going on, you know, in front of the judge and the testimony or the cross-examination. It was what was going on where people were sitting around me. Every day, there were supporters of Al Sharpton and his friends who came to the courtroom. And for the most part, they were African American. And they watched as the defendants continued to argue that Tawana Broly had been telling the truth, that she had been attacked by four white law enforcement officials. And here they were still making this argument that had been disproven over and over again. And I saw no evidence that they presented to change my mind about it. But all of the African Americans in the courtroom seemed to be convinced that Brawley had been telling the truth. Now, I could have just thought they're crazy, misguided, but I had actually also taken the time to know something about the history of African Americans in this country, under slavery, under the segregated South, under Jim Crow, and I realized that there was this long history of exactly this happening to African Americans, of white law enforcement officials covering up the crimes that were committed upon African American women. And so while it didn't necessarily change my opinion about this case, understanding something about where these people were coming from, understanding something about history, I brought that to my reporting so that at least other people could understand why, despite what the evidence looked like, these people were willing to believe something very different. And my old friend Dostoevsky was with me too because I understood that people are not always rational. There are deeper forces at work in us and I will say, I never got to go to Russia while I was here. They have a great study abroad program, and you should take it. And again, expose yourself to people who are not like you and understand them. Now, I know there is a lot of pressure on you to be practical. History and literature are great, but not everyone's going to work for public radio. We don't have enough jobs anyway. Um, but I want to tell you, and I'm not going to tell you not to worry about those things, because you should. You should worry about them. But you are lucky to be here because you've got the rest of your life to be practical. Take some of the time you have here to study things that are not practical. I think you'll be better for it. And I guarantee you, when you go and look for a job at a company, I can certainly tell you out in Silicon Valley that they're also looking for people who are not just great programmers, but people who are creative. Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple Computers said that the people who created Apple were great musicians, writers, artists, who also happened to be great programmers. And Steve Jobs considered himself an artist. The other thing that's important while you're here is not just to spend time in class. Find an outside activity that you love. It could be a sport, it could be the newspaper. Work for the NPR affiliate here. For me, it was the theater. I actually didn't have anything to do with radio when I was here. I did a lot of acting. Uh, and as you can see, I did not end up in theater. But it was great because I met people who had a common interest with me. And it's a great way when you're having fun, actually, to have fun talking about something you're all enjoying doing. In my case, it was theater. And I know they're on parties on campus, and you should enjoy them, and you should have a good time. The other thing about doing theater is I learned something about working together. One of the key things about theater is that it only works if everybody doing it comes together. The lighting designer, the costume designer, the actors. 
Working on a production was in this way great preparation for life, for anything you're going to do. No matter what you're doing in life, working with other people, seeing what they're good at, seeing what you're good at, and coming to creator together to create something bigger than yourself. Is, it's such a great life skill. And I use it all the time and think about it all the time. Part of why I took to radio also has to do with that background, because it was kind of like a performance. And when we write stories in radio, we talk about scenes, and we collect sound effects. So it was very theatrical to me, and I loved that. And I can tell you that without the engineers, the editors, the producers, I could not do it. What ends up on the air is also a result of all of their work. You are so lucky to be here. Take some risks while you're here. It's a great place to flop because there's less at stake. Once you leave here, there's going to be a lot more at stake. Maybe a job or a life, who knows. But the theater was also a great place for me to take risks. I was involved with the workshop with this experimental theater troupe called the Iowa Theater Lab. They were kind of crazy, but this was still, we're just coming out of the 70s. So. Um, and we got to team up with a partner and do an improv piece for 10 minutes that we had to rehearse. And my partner didn't tell me that what I was doing really wasn't working. <laughs> it, was, it was flopping, but she was afraid to tell me. But the teacher did. And I learned something at it. I, I learned something about how to express myself and be a better communicator. Just a few last things for you all. This is a small school, and that means you can really get to know your professors. You should do that. This is a time in your life when you have people around you who are invested in your success. That is really special. Though this is only four years of your life, it will be more consequential than almost any other four years of your life. This is a pivotal time. You're sowing the seeds of the person you are going to become outside of here. And last but not least, follow your curiosity and your heart. They're both muscles. If you don't use them, they atrophy. These colleges are where I learned to keep both of them in shape. And I've made choices about what to do with my life. I've always checked back with that part of me that was formed here. I've always followed my heart and my head. The Crystal Palace is a lovely place, but no one wants to live in a house where everything will break if you laugh too hard or dance too fast. Figure out what keeps your head and your heart going while you're here. You are so lucky, really. Welcome. Thank you. You can see why we invited Laura to speak to us. And now we'll have Dean Kanzig uh, introduce our William Smith speaker. Thank you, Laura Seidel, for that inspiring talk and great words of advice for all of us. As the Dean of William Smith College, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the William Smith student speaker today. Each spring semester, students elect one rising junior from each of the colleges to serve as a non-voting member of the Board of Trustees for one academic year. In their senior year, these student trustees become voting members of the board. This year, that William Smith student is Brianna Moore, whom I have had the pleasure of knowing since her first days on campus. A senior from New Haven, Connecticut, Brianna is a biology ma major who this summer presented her research on genetic markers at the Botany Conference in Fort Worth, Texas. In addition to her role as a student trustee, Brianna is a senior resident, vol assistant, volunteers at the Boys and Girls Club here in Geneva, and also works in the Office of Campus Safety. Brianna Moore.
Thank you, Dean Kenzik. I came to HWS thinking it wouldn't be much different from my boarding school. I knew I'd have to make a new group of friends, learn how to live in a new atmosphere, and find my place in what I considered a small world full of 18 to 23 year olds. My parents dropped me off with no problem because they were used to me being away and quite frankly enjoyed it. For me, transitioning from a high school of only 175 kids to a college of over 2,000 proved to be difficult. My first night of orientation weekend, I didn't participate in any events, but instead hid in my room because I didn't feel comfortable and didn't know anyone. I started my first few weeks only socializing with my roommates and first year seminar classmates. I noticed that the majority of my classmates and people on campus were getting involved, including my field hockey player roommate and my also dancer roommate. So it wasn't easy for me to figure out where I belonged. I felt like the oddball by not exploring what my campus had to offer. It may sound funny, but soccer has had a major impact on my social life. By having unintentional conversations while getting food or waiting in line to swipe in, I met my best friends and a great deal of people I have hang out with today. I was forced to socialize, with, which made me uncomfortable, but it has brought me to where I am today. I've had the opportunity to be an RA to first years for the last three years, the chair of judicial board, a student worker in many different areas, and it has afforded me the opportunity to talk to you all today as one of your student trustees. While I'm grateful for all of my accomplishments and opportunities that I've been given, they would not have happened if I did not become comfortable with being uncomfortable. College is a time for you to explore, get out of your comfort zone, and educate yourself in areas you may not have been interested in before. With the endless amount of opportunities and resources and clubs, there is something here for everyone. And if you can't find it on your own, there's always someone here to help. If there's one thing that I've learned in the last three years, it is that at the end of your four years, you'll have a story. That story will hold chapters full of memories that you'll create from the games and events you'll attend, the social events where you'll meet your best friends, and the journey you took to find your career path. Getting involved will enhance your college experience, so take advantage of your time, because before you know it, you'll be writing the end of your undergrad story. As I write the end of my story, I've learned that everything that I wanted was on the other side of fear, that it's okay not to know what direction your life will go in, and that I was most uncomfortable when outside of my comfort zone. Welcome, classes of 2021. Thank you, Brianna. Lovely. As a dean of Hobart College, it is my honor to introduce Tyler Fuller, Hobart student trustee like Brianna. Tyler is a voting member of the Board of Trustees. From Caledonia, New York, Tyler is double majoring in biochemistry and Spanish and Hispanic studies. He studied abroad in Spain and this summer in a program funded by the National Science Foundation, he conducted research on nano-sized drug delivery systems in Puerto Rico. He's a member of the Druid Society, vice president of Sigma Chi fraternity, a technician for HWS emergency medical services, past president of the HWS Republicans, and co-host a, a radio show. Ladies and gentlemen, Tyler Fuller. Hi, everyone. I'd like to first off thank Dean Baer for the kind introduction. I'd like to also thank everyone else for their inspiring words. Um, and just to break the ice here, in case you were wondering, that was me at the Variety Show wearing the panda mask and the nightgown, lip singing Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball. Um, but you'll get to see a different side of me today. So I have a few quick things to share. So I'm a pretty big basketball fan. Do we have any basketball fans out there? No, none? All right. Um, <laughs> So I heard in my high school that high school is kind of like a basketball game. But we're in college now. So what does that mean? 
well, we're still the players. And while the professors can be considered assistant coaches, whether we like it or not, we're the head coaches. And come to think of it, except for campus safety and maybe the deans, we're the referees now too. And each year you take more and more control of your life. And by the end of your four years, you're expected to be in complete control. And that may sound scary, but it's not. It's exciting. Because you'll be able to look back at the past four years and see what you've done, the people you've met, and the support system that you've established. Hobart and William Smith Colleges is like Hotel California. You can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. And while that may not be the perfect explanation, give me a chance to explain myself. So, so let, me, let me tell you about a time that I tried to check out. After a long, long day of interviewing candidates as a member of the presidential search committee, um, we, finished, we finished our interviews for the day and I ran into the bathroom and changed out of my suit and in my sweatpants um, for the flight home. And the chair of the board of trustees, Tom Bazuda, looks at me and says, why'd you change? And I'm thinking in my head, why is he asking me, after being in a suit for 12 hours, why I changed into my comfortable clothes for the plane ride? I really couldn't understand why he was questioning it. He looked at me and said, always wear a blazer in the airport. You never know when you're in for a job interview. You should always look and act professional. He told me that he once offered someone a job that he met at a CVS. Keep that in mind. So after hearing that advice, and I don't know if I've told him this yet, but for spring break I flew to Fort Lauderdale, wearing a blazer the entire time. What his advice did not touch on was what happens if the airport you're landing in is 100 degrees Fahrenheit and you're sweating like a pig. But I wore that blazer nonetheless. And this is, this is where it gets interesting, I promise. I was walking through the Rochester airport in my, in my blazer, hopped on the plane, flew to Fort Lauderdale, got off the plane, walked through the entire airport, sweating all over. And then all of a sudden, I left the Fort Lauderdale airport and not a single person offered me a job. <laughs> but maybe, maybe next time it will happen and it, I want to go to graduate school anyway, so that's not huge for me right now. And I've also gotten some advice from someone very similar to uh, trustee Tom Bazzuto, and that's John Cena. He's a pro wrestler. Um, and he once said, if you don't learn from your mistakes, then they become regrets. So think about this. Now, I apologize in advance for everyone who's standing and not sitting in these chairs. So everyone reach under their chair. Everyone on stage, everyone in the audience, everyone reach under your chair. Even you guys up here, even you, President Vincent, everyone reach under their chair. Now, you're going to find nothing there, okay? <laughs> so now take this, take this nothing, hold it out in front of you. This represents the amount of regrets that you should have at the end of the academic year. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have bad days. Learn from them. Use your growing support system that you have to help you ensure that these mistakes don't become regrets. And always, always wear a blazer. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. I need to get a blazer. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Nan Crystal Lawrence, professor of, professor of Geoscience, which is why I don't have a blazer, and Senior Dean of Faculty. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor of Philosophy, and my colleague, Scott Brophy, the 2017 recipient of the Faculty Prize for Teaching. After receiving a BA in Philosophy from Hobart College, in 1978, Professor Brophy went on to earn his master's degree and PhD from the University of Rochester. He teaches and writes about philosophy and public policy, especially in the areas of law, the environment, and education. He is founder of the Environmental Studies Summer Youth Institute, a nationally acclaimed program for high school students. Operating since 1993 on the HWS campus, ESSYI integrates field-based, laboratory, and classroom approaches to project-centered environmental science and policy. 
Professor Brophy is also the, a founding member of the Reading and Writing for Critical Thinking Project, a teacher training and school improvement program active in 40 countries on five continents. Designed to promote active learning and critical thinking, the project was recognized by UNESCO and the International Bureau of Education as a best practice in peace building internationally. Professor Brophy has served as a consultant for the Peace Corps and advises public and independent schools in the United States. Give it up for, for, for Professor Brophy. Thanks, Nan. I've been advised by friends and relatives to avoid uh, talking about our president. I mean of the country, not of our new president of HWS. And also that I should probably avoid talking about politics in general. I've also been urged not to talk about another topic that interests me a great deal, global climate change. As it turns out, I was going to say something at the beginning about each of those topics. And that one of the things that democracy in America and global warming have in common is that in both cases, we are in really, really deep shit. <laughs> I was then going to point out that some of us here have the luxury of living in something of a bubble where neither of those things affect us right now or on a daily basis. By way of something optimistic, I thought I'd end by saying if you happen to be one of those folks living in one of those bubbles where you don't spend any time thinking about either national or global events, let alone do anything about it, like say vote, Enjoy it while you can, because it's not going to last. Then I was going to say thank you and return to my seat. In retrospect, my friends and family were right that that would have been a terrible way to begin. <laughs> what an unclear introduction that would have been. What are you supposed to take away from that as you start your first college semester? Well, the point was that I was trying to be the first of many of your professors who will challenge you to think about the enormous position of privilege we all are in if we're sitting here at Hobart and William Smith. Not that you should feel guilty about that. After all, it wasn't really your fault. It was mostly dumb luck that got each of us in that position. But there are some responsibilities that go along with being lucky that way. And what a great place being in college and being at HWS in particular to think about those things. In mulling this over, I realized I'm actually a little more optimistic than that. There really is a reason for cautious optimism about both the future of democracy and about the future of the planet. That reason is, in a word, you. Uh, things are going to get worse before they get better, and I doubt the people who cause these problems will solve them. But your generation might. When I went to college, you had to work much harder to be any sort of national or global citizen. Do find a way to figure out your own connection to the wider world. And don't just retreat from it into other centuries in the world of academia. Of course, I dive into academia and other centuries pretty much every day and with both feet. What I'm suggesting is we don't do only that. While I don't have any specific prescriptions that are quite universal enough to fit everyone in this large and diverse group, I do want to suggest that 
things like those topics I shouldn't have talked about, like the future of democracy and if that's not big enough, even bigger things really do depend on you. Others today have mentioned how lucky you are to be spending four years, give or take, here at Hobart and William Smith. And you've heard about lots of ways that a liberal arts education can change your life. However you imagine your life in 5, 10, 20, 40, 50 years from now, there is one thing you can do during the next four years, all of you. That thing is the single overarching main purpose of a liberal arts education, wherever and however you'll be living in the future. Whatever else you do, try your best to make the inside of your head a more interesting place to live. It is where you'll be living for the rest of your life. There have been great suggestions offered today about how to go about working on that project. It takes work to figure out which of those apply to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brophy, for that powerful reminder of higher education to make the inside of your head a more interesting place to live. And I would add that when deployed correctly, your education can also be a mighty tool to make the world around you a more interesting and better place to be. I think it's the responsibility of those fortunate enough to attend college to make a difference in the world. I first arrived at Hobart and William Smith in 1979 from New York City in the Bronx High School of Science. As mentioned, I majored in history and economics and played sports here. I benefited greatly from my professors who mentored me and pushed me to excel. Old Hobart and William Smith deans, my coaches, and to the many staff who worked so hard to ensure that I had what I needed to succeed. When I returned to campus last year to deliver the convocation address, I was thrilled to see that even though so much had changed since I was a student, the ethos, the bones of this place, remained. The faculty I met are experts in their fields, who are dedicated to teaching, like Professors Brophy, Ahrens, and Lucas. The students, like Brianna, Tyler, Tanier, and Allie, are articulate, driven, and compassionate. The staff, like Coach Hannah and Kathy Regan, are among the best in the nation. Our alums, like Tom Bazzuto and Kira Gard and our distinguished speaker, Laura Seidel, are at the top of their fields. And Geneva is a vibrant place full of energy and momentum. A year ago, I left Geneva to return to Texas, positive that the colleges were on an upward trajectory. That became especially clear just last week when we received important outside validation that all the hard work and effort of the past decades is paying off. Last week we learned that Forbes had named Hobart and William Smith among the nation's top institutions with the best return on investment, including HWS in its 2017 Grateful Grads Index. 2017 was the second year in a row and the third time in the last four years that Hobart and William Smith colleges were recognized among the top colleges and universities with the most recipients of Fulbright awards. This year, Sports Illustrated and Money Magazine ranked the colleges among the best for sports lovers. 
And as you may have heard just two weeks ago, the Princeton Review ranked Hobart and William Smith 18th in the nation for happiest students, 18th in the nation for best faculty, and number one in the nation for study abroad programs. You'll see the banners behind me feature photos of students abroad and programs on every continent except Antarctica. And, and uh, we might have to change that. We might have to send an expedition uh, there. A full 60% of our Hobart and William Smith students participate in off-campus study before they graduate, whether it's interning with an organization in Vietnam, studying Spanish and living with a host family in Spain, or conducting field work on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Such experiences complement and enhance the on-campus academic program. And if I must say, the only regret I have in my four years was that I did not study abroad here and waited till my doctoral studies to study abroad. So don't make that mistake. Indulge me for a moment while I read a few comments from current students cited in the Princeton Review. One student says, I've never had a professor that did not inspire me while here. Another student declares, basically every single class I have walked out of, I've called my mom or dad to, to discuss some wild new set of information that I learned I hadn't known before. That's a pretty awesome thing. Another says, I absolutely love what I've done in my studies here and how my mind has morphed in turn for the better. One student said that HWS is extremely well-rounded college with superb academic, career, extracurricular, and athletics opportunities for all of its students. And another says, HWS has an extensive alumni network that helps students find work after college. They also report excellent access to great internships. Now, I'm not sharing these comments to convert any of you into loving Hobart and William Smith. I realize I'm preaching to the choir. We are all here because we want to be here, because we know that HWS as a place for transformation, a place that gives students clarity of purpose and direction, and a place that produces extraordinary outcomes. Recognition like we're getting from Forbes, Money Magazine, Sports Illustrated, and Princeton Review comes from years of hard work of striving to always be better. It's faculty spending hours with students talking about a theory or work, working together on research. It's staff members working late into the night to make sure that students have internships and solid financial aid packages. It's coaches bragging just as much about the academic achievements of their players as they do about scores and stats. It's alumni and alumnae who stretch to make a transformative gift or offer a job to a recent graduate. It's community members who mentor our students in the hope that those students take what they have learned here in Geneva and apply it to whatever community they will eventually call home. Hobart and William Smith is a place that traditionally punches above our weight, and lately the guidebooks and the marketplace are catching wind of it. This school is hot. In the coming year, I intend to focus on four pillars of effort that I strongly believe will give us the additional resources and motivation necessary to leverage our many successes and take our place among the best colleges in the country. First, we must ensure that the student experience in the classrooms, in the residence halls, on the playing field, abroad, and in the community is multifaceted, relevant, and comprehensive. Second, we must deepen engagement within and among key constituent groups, ensuring that all members of the broad HWS community and beyond understand, experience, and can leverage the return on investment of a Hobart and William Smith education. Third, we must be market smart and mission driven. The success of the colleges moving forward will be defined by our ability to evolve programming 
increase productivity, and pursue re renew revenue streams while also ensuring the integrity of the college's values as a national liberal arts college. Fourth, we must reclaim inclusive excellence and diversity as a key strategic priority. The educational benefits of diversity directly and powerfully impact all students with an understanding that inclusion is a compelling public good. We must work to increase the racial and ethnic diversity of our students, faculty, and staff and celebrate all dimensions of diversity. So we begin the new academic year knowing that we face challenges and disappointments ahead. We live in a world where bigotry still exists as it did in Charlottesville turned to violence, where affirmative action must be defended and human rights protected, where climate change is doubted and social media and fake news passes for the truth. But we also begin the new academic year as a community grounded in the principles of justice and respect the, that values and defends diversity and inclusion. We are a campus that stands united in the pursuit of knowledge, that believes in the capacity of art, literature, music, theater, and dance to uplift, and that recognizes the power of science and ideas to change the world. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. goes like this. The function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of a true education. I believe that Hobart and William Smith is teaching students to think intensively and critically and that we're building the kind of community that gives students intelligence plus character. I look forward to the year ahead. Thank you. Please rise. And now, dear ones, as you begin a new year, go forth to fashion a new community. May you find blessing in your waking and in your sleeping, in your studying and in your teaching, in solitude and in friendship, in your work and in your play. Seek justice, love kindness, walk humbly, go in peace. This now concludes convocation and begins the 2017 and 18 academic year.